grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the gospel lesson just read, John the Baptist sending the last of his disciples to Jesus. You will see that though the human heart lack real motivation but to serve yourself, the gospel reveals Jesus' drive and purpose to serve this soul confused in sin. Again, the Savior's commission, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. So for the text, let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. Toddlers never cease in finding something to do, putting things in their mouths they shouldn't, fascinated by sights you and I take for granted. Every activity becomes play, every item about the house a play thing, whether it should be or not, which is why you have to keep your eye on a toddler every moment in the constant stressor that they are too busy. Too busy, that is, for us parents to keep up with, because somewhere past those toddler years, all that fascination starts slowing down. Once the child is old enough to open the refrigerator, Stand in front of it with no concern for the electric bill, stare in at shelves filled with food, only to remark there is nothing to eat. There's nothing to watch. Well, they sit and stare at countless hours of that nothing were you to let them, and especially, especially when it comes to work, there is nothing to do. Which, from a teenager's mouth, is always a lie. Well, in our gospel lesson today, the disciples of John the Baptist suffer from such disinterest and lethargy as full-grown men. Now, when they were toddlers, so to speak, at the beginning of their spiritual journey with John, they found themselves fascinated by absolutely nothing. Nothing to eat other than locusts and wild honey. Nothing to see out there than barren wilderness. Which also meant not a lot to do. Every now and again, people made their way out to see what John the Baptist was up to. But the four Gospels indicate that John was not a big talker. Each encounter with him, succinct and to the point, he forgave their sins sent them back on their way, back to work, back to the job they come from. But now, some years later, John, sitting in prison, his disciples are like Jesus' proverbial seed, which sprouts up fast only to shrivel. John's spiritual children no longer fascinated with every little thing. No peering through a window into John's prison cell like staring into the refrigerator. They see no more spiritual meat to be had. No longer anything to watch, though there really never was. They wonder if after all this time following John, whether there's now nothing to do other than sit and watch him die in prison? And when he does, what then? Their doubt is a listlessness common to us all. It is our distaste for the mundane, for your daily routine. Each task you take up only begrudgingly, or refuse to, because you don't see the point. The many hours wasted each week or day chasing my priorities over others 
wasting the many good opportunities to do what you know is right in order to wander into the wilderness of a wide range of minor sins and idle talk because there's nothing else to do. Much like John's disciples, who were given so much to sit at the forerunner's feet, to watch the kingdom of heaven unfold, soul after soul receive new birth through water and the word, but now near John's death, act as if they hadn't heard a thing, when everything John had proclaimed was indeed happening that very moment, not there in his prison cell, but absolutely everywhere else in the land, where everywhere else Jesus and his disciples roamed, all over the place. How could you not see it? Because it was happening behind their backs. Only though, because they stood staring into the cooler. Any good parent might tell them, I'll give you something to do. But the scriptures have far harsher words for these things we leave undone, your every idle moment. Like the unprofitable servant who, instead of getting up and putting his talent to good use, took and hid it in the earth. Jesus had harsh words, calling him a wicked and slothful servant, from whom shall be taken away even that which he hath to be cast into outer darkness, replete with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heart-piercing law from the mouth of the Savior, which drives home the point that there is nothing to do is always a lie, teenager or not. But the great grace to be found in our lesson today is how John the Baptist deals with his disciples so very differently than they deserve. And in turn, the Savior Jesus who so craftily puts these men with nothing to do to wholesome kingdom work. Now John couldn't have been clearer that all who heard his voice out in the wilderness were to move on to Jesus, uh, the one, John said, whose shoes latch it, I am not, I am not worthy to unloose. John should rightfully have rebuked them. What are you still doing here? Yet he has compassion on their lack of direction in life. The listlessness he must to some degree have felt himself as he sat there in prison waiting for death. So instead, John puts them to work in his brilliant one-liner way. Well, why don't you go ask Jesus? If anything I did had a point. Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? A brilliant tactic on John's part, really the Spirit's part. Because there's never anything more worthwhile to do than go talk to Jesus. Upon arrival, Jesus provides a thorough overview of everything these John's long-lingering disciples had missed out on. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, Jesus diagnoses our there's nothing to do lethargy as spiritual blindness, closing our eyes to that which if it weren't for our sin would be impossible to miss. Meaning, you and I only think there's nothing to eat, see, or do when you're not looking at him who provides all things. The only cure then, as Jesus does, is to have the gospel repeated to you. As Jesus repeats to them what their eyes had missed, 
only because they've been staring into the cooler, and gets them in truly crafty manner to take it to heart with the command, now go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. For previous dawdlers, completely lacking in motivation, all this back and forth from John to Jesus back to John, this is a lot of work. And that's the point. Here, the Savior tricks them into working, just as any smart parent would do with your child. Yes, clever on Jesus' part, because in all this memorizing and repeating, the lengthy list of everything Jesus had been up to, everything John the Baptist told them he'd do, there is one thing missing, a big one. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It is striking that in this list of everything that is happening, that were they looking no eye could miss, Jesus makes no mention of that, the Lamb of God part. That was yet to come. In other words, by leaving out that one detail from the list, Jesus is saying, yes, there's a lot going on here, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Though when it does happen, few would look, and fewer at the time would see it for what it was. If anything would seem to have not been worth the effort, it's the bitter labor of Jesus' cross. Yet this was the one task given him from eternity, the whole reason he was made flesh and dwelt among us, to offer his righteousness up in the place of our sin, which for Jesus meant following whatever his father said despite whatever sense it made to our human reason or not. As our hymn declares, the Son obeyed his Father's will, was born of virgin mother, and God's good pleasure to fulfill, he became my brother. No garb of pomp or power he wore, a servant's form like mine he bore, to lead the devil captive. When the innocent child born of Mary chose to put in his mouth a sponge filled with sour wine, stared out into the sky to remark how he had been forsaken by his own father, and in the end was left with nothing to do other than give up the ghost and die in order to complete the most important task ever given, from sin and sorrow to set us free Slay bitter death for us that we may live with him forever. So that with this his saving work, your eternal redemption complete, you might find concerning each task given you a sense of purpose in him, in the Savior, who in every resurrection appearance puts souls as confused as you and me to a wholesome kingdom by forgiving you your lack of discipline, forgiving you dissatisfaction with daily routine, the apathy for the love his Ten Commandments require, this gospel renews your soul with the innocence of a child. That like a toddler, you might now never cease finding things to do. What did you this day? come here for to see. A man dressed in a black robe, the after-church snacks. Nothing better to do with your morning? That's all fine and good in that those kind of things are the best any of us can come up with. But regardless whatever reason your carnal mind came to sit and stare up here today, 
You've been tricked the same as John's disciples to open your hymnals each time I fast and repeat with your lips out loud what it is Christ Jesus came to do. That departing with the gospel preached unto and by you once more, you might turn around and live out such faith as yours every which way given you. As the apostle commands, whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The apostle proceeds to list out probably the most undamed tasks you can think of, that of wife, husband, children, father, servant, the, the list is endless. The apostle calling you to peer past any lack of earthly motivation in your heart, to peer past the undeserving mere human being before your eyes, to serve instead the Lord who has treated you beyond what any sinner deserves. As he concludes, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not up to men. Yes, a good deal of this work is the boring stuff no one wants to do. The thankless chores no man would choose, but exciting work all of it, solely on account of the word of the Savior, who said, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but then went on to say, Of you, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. May these words of Jesus and Jesus' crafty way with us all. Make your nothing to do, nothing to watch, nothing to eat. So much to do with so little time till he returns. That all you can do is repent. Return to his word. And through faith, watch his kingdom flourish all around you. Till the day you feast with him above. Now the peace that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.